Hello everyone, we're getting ready to look up today with a brand new Uplook video with a needed top 10 list. You can like the video, subscribe, and ring the bell to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Today's topic offers 10 ways to support your elders. They're called elders because of their spiritual maturity. They're called overseers because of their responsibility. How much we need them today among the Lord's flock. Their work is often difficult. How can we help and encourage these men and their families? Christ, the chief shepherd, someday will reward them. But how can we assist them on the journey? Let's start with number one. Get to know your elders personally and treat them as good friends. Right. The scripture says, know those who labor among you. I think of a young man, Murray, out in the city of Winnipeg in Canada, and he decided he didn't know his elders. He was in a medium-sized local church. So he started to ask them on a Saturday morning, one at a time, if they'd go with him to McDonald's for breakfast. And he'd sit there and talk a little bit about his own heart for the local church. And then he would ask them questions like, what books did you read as a young man? And tell me your testimony. And what were the influences that made you seek after God with your whole heart? And he came to know his elders in such a way. They thought he was the greatest young guy in the local church, but he was interested in knowing them and knowing what their strengths were, what areas they were ministering in the local church, and then he would ask them where he could help. A tremendous thing. So I think it's good for us all to realize that these men weren't born in the baptistry. Some of them have been drunkards or have had tremendous difficulty in their lives, and they're trophies of God's grace. And when we think of them simply as somebody, sort of the finished product, instead of realizing they've been through the things we've been through, and they can help us once we come to understand who they really are. Number two, be approachable. I think that's so important. A woman said to me one time, the elders never come to visit me. And I said, well, does your odometer work on your car? And she said, yeah, what's that got to do with anything? I said, well, if you'd go out and measure the distance from the elder's house to your house, and then from your house to the elder's house, you'll find within a quarter of a mile it's the same distance. In other words, why don't you go visit them? Elders are supposed to be examples to us. They're not supposed to do all the work. When they visit, they're setting an example for all of us to visit. I wonder how many elders actually get a pastoral visit, someone coming to care for them. It rarely happens. And so I think when we begin to understand this, it shouldn't be that we sort of set this distance from our elders so that if they show up, we think, well, am I dying? Do they know something I don't know? Uh, it should be a family relationship. They're spiritual fathers to us. They shouldn't surround our house. This is the elders. We're coming in. You know, Let's be approachable to them and let them feel that they can come to us at any time and talk to us. Number three. Utilize them as guides in your pathway to Christ. So the writer to the Hebrews in chapter 13 and verse 7 says, Remember those who are your guides and have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct, the end of their lifestyle. And of course we know what the next verse says, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So they're like one sight on the rifle. You need two. And we have Christ, and Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So Christ in some ways may be harder to follow in the sense that we can't see him with our eyes, but we can see our elders. And if we follow them as they follow Christ, then we will end up where they're ending up. So it's saying in our heart, I like how he raises his kids. I like how he loves his wife. I like how he shares the word. I like how he cares for God's people. That's where I'm headed. And so we don't follow them in their failures or their foibles. 
elders have flaws just like everybody else. The only perfect elders are in heaven. So my elders aren't perfect. But I don't follow them in that. I follow them in the area of their faithfulness. And if I do that, then I'm going to end up where they're headed, which is Christ. Then number four, pray for them, including their wives and family. We recognize that novices are not to be placed as elders, and why is that? Well, because they're not ready to take on the frontal attack of Satan. Elders come under special attack because if you can bring the elders down, you can get the sheep. And so we need to be especially bolstering our elders with prayer. Unity in the church is not accidental. It's not something that just automatically happens. And so for unity among the elders leads to unity among the flock. If the elders aren't going in God's direction, the sheep just mill around and before you know it, they start wandering off. So we need to pray for our elders. We also need to pray for their wives because the elder's wife sometimes has a very difficult task. She sees her husband with burdens and he can't share the information with her. She has lonely nights when the elders are out seeking for wandering sheep or helping young couples or whatever it might be. So we need to pray for the elder's wife. And then of course we need to pray for the elder's children because if Satan can't get the elder, he goes after his wife. And if he can't get the wife, he goes after the kids. And the children sometimes live under the spotlight because they're kind of the measure of the elder's ministry. And so they have special needs and we should seriously think about praying for them and verbally encouraging them, telling elders' wives, we appreciate what you're going through and thank you for releasing your husband to do the work that he does. Then number five, ask if you can relieve them of some menial tasks. This was the idea originally when the elders or the apostles who were the acting elders in the early church were overburdened with things and so they said to the Christians, you appoint some deacons. Well, the word deacon is used both in a specific sense and in a general sense. It's simply one of the words for a servant. So Phoebe, she wasn't one of the official deacons, but she was a servant of the church at Sancria. So sometimes the deacons are entrusted with special responsibilities, looking after a building, looking after the widows, whatever it is. They're accountable to the local church for this stewardship that's been entrusted to them. And so they're recognized by the church, whereas the elders are appointed by the Lord. They're raised up by the Lord and they're accountable directly to him. So there's that specific sense of deacons, but there's another sense in which we're all to do deacon work. And the objective again is to free up people who are laboring in the word, for example, in order to teach the word of God. They may spend many hours studying the word and we want to free them up. So if I can clip his hedge, cut his grass, get his car washed, his oil changed, whatever, and buy back some time for him, so that he can invest that in visitation or Bible study or whatever it is, shepherding work, then I'm investing not only in that man, but I'm investing in my local church that way. Number six, offer to go with them in suitable service for the Lord. I think it's good if you have a larger local church, sometimes you can double the workforce if one elder can take another younger man along with him, if you're visiting the shut-ins, visiting in the hospital, whatever, obviously sensitive moral issues or whatever may not be appropriate. But in a lot of visitation, you could hook up with that elder. Instead of two elders going, have one elder and an understudy. So I think that uh, doubles the workforce in many cases to get things done. And of course, you can spend time riding in the car, asking questions, discussing Bible doctrine, discussing service opportunities as you travel. Number seven, give them honor and double honor if they labor in the word. This is a greatly misunderstood passage, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. Some people say this means that they should receive funds well, it may mean that, but it can't 
only mean that because if we look at the next paragraph, it says there that servants are to give their masters all honor. So obviously there it doesn't mean that the servants are to give all their money to their masters. What it means, and the idea of honor there is recognizing the value of their ministry and it should be a two-way street. If I benefit from your teaching or from your pastoral care, your counseling, then I should think of ways to invest in you so that there is a mutuality about the benefit. And that's how the body works. It's not that one part of the body does everything for everybody else and doesn't get anything back. So when we're dealing with a situation with an elder, it may be that just as they make sure an unemployed brother has groceries or a widow has a little money, we should consider their financial situation. I know one elder and he's in real estate and every Sunday he's committed to helping God's people. It's the number one real estate day in his part of the country and he loses hundreds of thousands of dollars a year from his business because he's doing that. I'm not sure that he wants a check. What he could want are other things that would be encouraging to him. I think if you are considering an elder, not only financially, but in ways that enrich them, it could be getting them a restaurant card to take their family out for supper. It could be getting them a card to buy some Bible study books that they would like to get. Uh, it may be getting them a gas card so that they could travel more and, and visit the saints more. I don't know what it would be, but there are ways that we can think about that and not just simply take, take, take from the elders, but find ways to encourage them and enrich them and offer them honor. And so the idea of honor is considering the value of these people, not treating them like charity cases where, okay, we're going to have to pay this guy because he doesn't have enough to look after his family, but as blue chip investment so that they're enriching us, we should be looking for ways to enrich and encourage them. And especially those who not only do the pastoral visitation and so on, but also are the ones who do most of the public teaching, it's double time. And so we should be considering both of these areas when we're thinking about how to enrich the elders' lives as they have enriched us. Number eight, be positive about your elders. Don't have a critical attitude toward them. Sometimes they have to rebuke us as fathers, and we should be able to take that. Suffer the word of exhortation, says the King James. We ought to be able to take it, especially because we know they care about us. They're not doing it for one-upmanship or because they're being critical of us. They want to help us. So take it as that. Take it as an effort on their part to improve our spiritual lives. And if that's the case, then don't begrudge them. Don't be jealous of their position. Don't have hard feelings about what they might have to do in order to keep the sheep in line. Learn to be happy towards them and to be positive towards them and encourage them. It's a much happier way to live life. And the scripture says that we should not even receive an accusation against an elder unless there are two or three witnesses. So when people say snide things about the elder, say, look, I can't even listen to this. If you want to be part of the solution, if there is a serious problem and you want to be part of the solution, if you have some witnesses, we can go and talk to that elder and entreat him as a father. That's good. But simply to criticize and to say nasty things about an elder, I can't even listen to that. Number nine, live in such a way that they are happy to give an account for you. Yes, that's straight out of scripture, isn't it? In Hebrews 13, 17, obey those who are guides for you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do it with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. We need to think seriously about this. 1 Peter 5 talks about the chief shepherd appearing and he's going to give them a crown of glory that doesn't fade away if they've been faithful shepherds. 
and we ought to be taking that seriously. Give them joy, right? As John would say, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in the truth. And so by simply obeying the Lord and walking in the truth, we give a great encouragement to these elders as they see us making spiritual progress. And lastly, number 10, express your thanks to them regularly. It should go without saying that if your mother cooks a nice meal for you, you say thank you. And if an elder gets up and serves a meal from the Word of God, we should say thank you. But that shouldn't be the only time you tell your mother thank you. She does lots of things, doing your laundry and mending and all sorts of things around the house. We should regularly express our thanks to our family members and also to our spiritual family members. I think of a group of young people in Silver Spring, Maryland, and they put on a banquet for their elders. And they actually, um, they did the serving, they provided the decorations, they planned a little singing where they sang as a choir, sang to the elders, and they had a nice gift for them. And they had a table of honor at the front, and they had the elders and their wives sit there. as beautiful, and you know, you just wonder how often that's done. But I think it's something that we ought to think about. The Lord will reward faithful under shepherds. They'll get a crown of glory. But we have a privilege now in the difficult days of showing them our appreciation. And if we do, God looks down upon us with favor. Remember how David, he was ashamed to have even touched the hem of Saul's garment. He called him the Lord's anointed. And we ought to think about our elders in a similar way that they have been raised up by God for our good. And it's a great thing to express our thanks to them for their service for the Lord in our lives.